I would help my like to cordially you not to invite you, but to invite you to participate in the upcoming lecture in our forum series with the Vatelsen <coughs> Dr. Franziska Martinsen here present on the subject Call for Human Rights Claims to Economic Autonomy in Global Human Rights Semantics. Let me start with some general remarks about the human rights debate. You know, it is so vast, so complicated, so diverse that it is nearly impossible to give an overlook to this complex field. However, human rights are concerned with protecting human beings from, from abuse, particularly by political and economic, economic forces for example, the challenging of the fundamental rights by authoritarian regimes or the use of dehumanizing practices in the pursuit of commercial profit. At the same time, these human rights are highly contested, not only in terms of their philosophical foundations, and uh, there is a real uh, strong and large and huge debate where they come from and how far we can go in the history to Aristotle and others and of course in other and different cultures and civilizations with other traditions but also and most especially with regard to their legal nature and should perhaps potentially be interpreted as more of a, as I would say, a hybrid combination of law, political programming and morality in which the tension between universalism and particularism emerges. Those are the key concepts that are in tension all the time when we speak about human rights. Human rights transport established key social principles, for example, through the protection of religious freedom or the recognition of indigenous rights. At the same time, the appeal to culture as part of the argumentative arsenal when seeking to loosen ties to human rights very often. But how does an understanding of law as culture, as we treat it here in the center, deal with the fact that human rights are also relativized in the name of culture, even though it is questionable whether there is a valid philosophical rationale in terms of material ethics or the universal validity of the values behind. Are the jurists right in the end who consider human rights debates to be completely uninteresting in terms of legal dogma if the political issue of implementation is not resolved? Is it not ultimately the case that we are repeatedly thrown back into bare survival existence mode and a community-based right to have rights in the civil context and does not Durkheim's theory of the sacredness of the individual as such, so as protecting the human being as such, independently of its religious content, lead us out of a fundamental dilemma. I know that your reference is more in the history of political thought but I would like to mention this sociological perspective on the human rights debate that was pursued from Durkheim to Hans Joas, Koenig and myself. In the learning community of our center, we had important discussions with Upendra Bakshi. What role is played by the derivation of human rights from an experience of suffering? And to what extent can we trust suffering as an emotive foundation of human rights which simultaneously involves mid-light, empathy, a topic which was examined systematically by the center's namesake, Kate Hamburger, as you quote in your books as well. So one could refer to the refugee crisis providing Europe with an opportunity to redefine empathy in a human rights context. 
This crisis is highlighting the links between the economy, culture, politics, and empathy in the human rights discourse and practice. There would be a lot to say about this context. I might also hint at uh, the next workshop in November, who will deal with the complex relationship of law and emotion. Dr. Franziska Martinsen is a political scientist and philosopher working at the intersection of the history of political and social ideas, political discourse and semantics, and the politics of implementation. She is Privatdozentin at the Leibniz University of Hannover and has been most recently an interim professor at the University of Bremen's Research Center for Inequality and Social Politics, alongside with visiting professorships at the University of Vienna, as well as an interim professor at the University of Greifswald, the University of Kiel, etc. In her lecture, she will give insight into her research project at the center, which builds upon the results of the study on Grenzen der Menschenrechte, Staatsbürgerschaft, Zugehörigkeit, Partizipation. I will let it circulate when you do it by yourself, so it has much more authority. That has come out in 2019, uh, some weeks ago or a month ago. In the context of our center that is looking at law as culture, as I alluded to before, we have to of course, to be aware of the fact that bringing in the cultural perspective, we will try to do it and we have to see where at which kind of point and with, uh, with which kind of consequences that this entails the risk to relativize the claims of the human rights normative order. The lecture will explore, as you said, and I'm quoting yourself, you will be much more precise about this, two main theses. One is that human rights cannot be grasped properly as individual and collective conditions of a self-determined life as long as they are understood as moral rights rather than political rights. The disputes and decisions about the conditions of human life, of political and economic autonomy, are to be viewed as matters of political practice, you say that should not be interpreted in a moral language, especially because the actual challenge, namely the participatory inclusion of all those affected by political decisions, is neglected. So I have to distribute a second book that came out really three weeks ago, Radicale Demokratie Theorie, a handbook. Um, I have read, meanwhile, I, got, I received it yesterday. I haven't read the whole thing. But the article about Hannah Arendt, Jean-Luc Nancy, and some others are really very, very interesting to be read and very revealing. So uh, if the rest is not completely wrong, <laughs> it would be worth for those two articles uh, to have a look into uh, this very interesting book. So I come to the second point where you will throw a glance at the Gloman at the global human rights semantics. And it's a kind of a new uh, debate, human rights semantics during some 20, 30 years perhaps, that for a longer while has not been the focus of human rights the debates and discourse. Um, so it is understood as part, as you can imagine now, of the political debate and not so much as part of the philosophical intellectual debates as such. Individual and collective claims to a human right to economic autonomy, autonomy as formulated, for example, by human rights NGOs will be examined and it will be questioned to what extent these can be understood as communication, self-communication processes about empowerment strategies in the struggle for specific rights to individual and collective autonomy. And this is also a new turn in, I would say, the debate of, about human rights that historiography has uh, discovered a new field of research. For a longer time it was not, it was just the question of, of, of human rights ideas 
as an intellectual uh, project, uh, so to say, uh, but what the use of and the history of making use of human rights uh, concerns had, uh, had not been in, this, in, in the focus. And historians, as you can see in Geschichte und Gesellschaft, uh, only one of the last numbers, uh, you can see uh, that there is a completely new interest in human rights that is worthwhile to be studied much closer than most of us jurists who have worked with human rights debates for, uh, for centuries, a bit, a bit for decades, uh, might be rather interesting, I would say. So, uh, of course, if there is no question that you have a very specific competence in the field. Through a lot of impressive publications, I'm only talking now, I have only talked about 2090. So you can imagine that there will be much more behind. Whether, and this is my last question in order to give the floor to you, whether your studies in music, you must know that she is really not only a musician, but you had also um, directed performances, etc., and studied music as a scientific field, that this might, or this is my question, might facilitate an access to the poetry of human rights or even the aesthetics of human rights as Bakshi proclaimed them. And he had promised to write a book about this for our center. It is not ready, as I see for the moment. Is there somebody who has read the book, the manuscript? Not yet. It may come. Including the risk of Grundrechtskitsch or Menschenrechtskitsch, as Josef Isensee sharply formulated once, so this might become visible during your conference if your musician side will help us to understand this aspect of the human rights debate, but it is much more important and deeper rooted in our consciousness um, to deal it very seriously. You will do that and I'm very curious with all of us to listen to your talk now. Very welcome at our center once again. Thank you very, very much for your uh, friendly and warm welcome and for the nice introduction and for your multi uh, uh introduction into um, my lecture and I don't know what to add now. <laughs> yes, but I will try um, to give you some hints um, to my work. Um, I cannot uh, tell you um, results because I'm going to do this research. It's um, what I'm um, telling you now is um, yeah part of my habilitation thesis and um, yes and an, an outline. Um, for the coming uh, months. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't make my uh, PowerPoint presentation um, fit to the um, yeah, to the uh, uh, colleagues' um, PowerPoint format, but yeah, you will uh, apologize because I wanted to show some pictures. And here's the first picture that is Olympe de Gouges for now of you, uh, for those of you who may be. Uh, don't know who she is, and she is my role model in a in a special um, um, perspective because she um, she identified the blind spots of the um, Déclaration uh, des droits de l'homme et du citoyen. She immediately um, recognized that the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights was not for women at all, and it was literally not for women. If the French um, uh, language indicates, uh, long shall mean um, man and woman, but um, yeah, it, um, in the political sense, it was not meant for women. And that was really sharp uh, witted by her, and um, I hope I will not share her lot because she was executed in uh, 1793 by what 
by the Robespierre's uh, regime, and I do not want to um, experience that. But I, I hope that um, I might, um, um, yeah, that I can point out to some blind spots of the conception of human rights. And I, um, I refer in this lecture, I will refer to, for example, um, French theorists current French theories and post-colonial discourses. And within this uh, post-colonial uh, post discourse on human rights, there's an argument shared by a number of theorists according to which human rights cannot not be wanted. It is said that an ambivalence of simultaneous um, attraction and repulsion is inherent in human rights. Their origins in the European tradition of natural law the corresponding Eurocentric and hegemonic bias of their conceptual foundations in the form of an abstract individual and a moral universalism, as well as the liberalistic dominance of the notion of property, make them appear suspect to many uh, post-colonial theorists, especially the liberal notion of um, individual autonomy, that is, the conception of the person as an autonomous, self-determining and independent agent has come under fire, as some theorists um, I'm quoting here say, and has drawn several calls for reconsideration of, for example, the value neutrality, the regress problem, that is uh, a philosophical problem, problematic liberal legitimacy, um, the problematic emphasis on integration, unity, agreement, and individual individualism itself. I cannot go into details here. It's it's more of a philosophical interest, but just to give you a picture of the problems. At the same time, human rights, not least with the historical uh, view of the French Revolution and all the more of the Haitian Revolution, where black people uh, started to uh, struggle against their oppression, um, um, human rights contain a profoundly emancipatory and in my lecture, I want to reflect on and somewhat weaken this post-colonial prejudgment on human rights um, by disclosing within them exactly that potential for autonomy of the individual, namely in an emancipatory sense. A prerequisite, um, Professor Gebhardt has already mentioned it, for this rediscovery of this original premise of human rights is the exploration of an alternative conception to present-day human rights that can be developed from the very idea of human rights itself. And I will show you that. I hope I can show you that. Uh, for that, a certain modification of the current understanding of human rights is needed. And I, yeah, I, uh, I took nearly 400 pages for it in my, in my book. Um, and I will give you just some thesis um, uh, in a nutshell of it. Um, a certain modification of the current understanding of human rights is needed, which has to be carried out both discursively, that means theoretically, philosophically, as I did in my book, and in practice, within the framework of political processes of subjectivation. And that means human rights, has to be, uh, human rights have to be conceived as political rights, rather than pre-political or moral universal values. So that is um, the outline of my lecture. My lecture will be divided into three parts. In the first section, relating to Hannah Arendt's thesis of the euphoria of human rights, you know that, I guess, I want to explain the ambivalences of human rights, which challenge the modern rights, uh, human rights theory. In the second part, based on the critique of the present conception of human rights, I take a look at their aspirative surplus from which, in my view, an empowering potential for individual autonomy could arise. And in the third part, I would give you the first hint, but it's just a very uh, vague um, view into my work I'm going to deal with here in the next couple of months, here at the Kita Hamburger Kolleg. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for um, letting me stay here and um, enjoy the wonderful atmosphere. Um, and I uh, anticipated it a bit pompously in my 
title of my lecture. I, I thought that maybe I would be um, a step further, but I'm not at the moment, but I will be uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm going to do the research on the um, bottom-up understandings, uh, different kinds of understandings of economic autonomy in the human rights, human rights context. So I come to the first section of my talk and to three ambivalences. There are more, but I just want to um, focus on these three. First of it is the ambivalence of universality and particularity, or I will uh, focus here on universality and historicity. While the aspiration of human rights is to be not universally valid, then at least universalizable, that is a philosophical uh, um, a differentiation, but that is important in, um, in a certain respect, it is clear from the context of their origins in European modern natural law that both their conceptual form as well as their content are subject to historical conditions and ideas. I mean, that is not new, but I just wanted to highlight uh, this aspect. The whole, of, uh, uh, the whole of humanity, or respectively the individual, may be claimed as the holder of human rights. Nevertheless, Structural powers such as the social gender order, the global economic order, or the real politic concept of national state sovereignty remain de facto or even de jure largely unaffected by these claims. And speaking of historical conditions and ideas, um, I mentioned already uh, Olaf de Bouche, who uh, pointed out the um, gendered. Um, 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 aspects of inequality within the um, uh, concept of uni um, universal rights. Karl Marx, for example, in his text on the Jewish uh, question, points out that the liberal concept of freedom, we can say autonomy here too, contains merely a limited idea of human freedom as a bourgeois expression of unbound economic interest and actually denies the potential of real human emancipation, from his point of view. This concept of freedom is based on a distorted image of the individual. He speaks of the uh, monad, the Leibniz concept of uh, window, less uh, monad without windows, uh, that is only concentrated of itself. Um, and um, this distorted image of the individual um, he, um, he is uh, convinced is um, claims to be general and abstract, but obscures the socio-economic implications. In the current version of human rights, as declared in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, emphasizes as well the rights of the individual, such as property rights or speech rights to fulfill the normative um, aim of individual autonomy, but in bourgeois or capitalist uh, context, these rights tend to empower the already powerful more than the vulnerable. From the post-colonial point of view, it is their inherent tendency to, uh, to depoliticize the crucial social and political lines of opposition within the globalized society. And then there's another um, um, hidden or um, distorted um, uh, aspect, the political legal guarantee of human rights for the individual is dependent, de facto dependent, on the status of citizenship. So the universality of the validity of human rights already ends at particular national boundaries, as we all know. Oh, I forgot to give you the slides. And now I come to the second uh, ambivalence of powerlessness and empowerment. The ambivalence of universality and historicity, um, uh, or ambivalence of universality and particularity, points to the tension between the human rights promise and their failure at the same time. On the one hand, the human rights demand for freedom and equality embodies a tremendous explosive power both in a political and social context, if we look in, uh, into the history of the revolutions. And on the other hand, it, it remains merely, um, merely rhetorical, 
at precisely those points where it appears to promise autonomy, inclusion and participation for the individual. According to Hannah Arendt, for example, human rights have a tautological or even empty meaning, especially in political terms. Under the present condition of national sover uh, sovereignty, human rights are either the rights of citizens, and then particular rights, I mean, it's a bit schematic, but I want to, um, you know, I want to um, highlight the problems here, not to uh, glance at the um, uh, gray tones. Um, human rights are either the rights of citizens, or they are the rights of their human beings, who are de facto without <coughs> any rights, as Hannah Arendt calls it, because of the conceptual tension between the abstract general and moral character of human rights on the one hand, and on the other, the fact that they attain political validity almost exclusively in the form of concrete civil rights guaranteed by the national state and um, in part by an international human rights regime, but um, the, um, then it's more humanitarian than political. Based on this premise, the exclusion of non-citizens from the ambit of human rights is, among other things, unavoidable. And thus, one of the main criticisms of the critical human rights discourse concerns the lack of a right to political participation within the present catalog of human rights. We have the right to, citizen, uh, uh, to national belonging and to citizenship, but there is no right to political participation apart or um, uh, independent from um, citizenship. And with that um, result, um, um, the um, right to political participation has not the same status as, for example, the right to freedom of expression or the right um, to assembly, let alone the right to, live, uh, to life or the right to freedom. At this point, a corresponding criticism of human rights comes into play by turning the tables and discussing the option in how far a right to political participation, independent of, uh, of citizenship, should be counted as part of an ineluctable core of human rights. And that is not only my, um, my idea, but um, there are several theorists um, who, um, yeah, who plead for that version, that uh, right to political participation or even a right to democratic participation should be on the minimal list of human rights. The third ambivalence of affirmation and critique. At this point, the third ambivalence of affirmation and critique is touched upon. To denounce, uh, to denounce the blind spots and distortions of the current human rights discourse does not necessarily mean to abandon the idea of human rights as a whole. That is just um, a trigger warning, so to say. The liberal tradition from which human rights have emerged not only incorporates arguments about freedom, autonomy, and equal worth, but it also incorporates arguments, arguments about civilization, cultural progress, and racial and religious superiority, contrasted with wildness, that is a quote, backwardedness and inferiority of the other. Ratna Kapoor, um, an Indian postcolonial theorist, is convinced that further human rights remain structured by this history, and this dark side is intrinsic uh, to human rights, rather than something that is merely broken and can be glued back together. The idea of an autonomous individual subject, which is the core of the current concept of human rights, deceives the fact that the complexity of multiple effectiveness, effectiveness <coughs> by, for example, gender, race, class, nationality, is not separable within the single person. On the one hand, subjects are marked by very different kinds of powers, identificatory characteristics such as gender, class, nationality, race, Sexuality are created through different histories, different discursive formations and regulatory schemes. And on the other hand, human beings are not fabricated as subjects in a mechanical, automatic manner. 
They're not built by these various powers as passive units. These powers are intersectionally intertwined and they cannot be radically extricated from one another in any particular historical formation. A paradoxical situation can then be identified in so far as human rights secure the standing as individuals in general. However, at the same time, they have to be specific and concrete to unmask discriminatory structures against the marginalized. For example, um, human rights for women or female human rights. And that is, yeah, that is really contested if this uh, grasp is, uh, is convincing. Uh, or even if it is convincing in, in some respect, uh, then it's problematic too. In this double function, there lies the risk of entrenching the subordination of the marginalized through that specificity, and they promise increased individual autonomy at the price of intensifying the fiction of um, autonomous subjects. In sum, modern human rights thinking imagines human rights as the rights of the abstract, autonomous individual. And Hannah Arendt objects to the concept of the abstract human being who seem to exist nowhere, which, according to the tradition of natural law, conceives the human being as detached from her historical determinants. According to Arendt, the contradiction between the liberal conception of an abstract, autonomous uh, autonomous human being and the social, political, and cultural constitution of human existence culminates in the fact that the status of having universal human rights is identical with the status of rightlessness and accordingly with the status of being thrown out of humanity. These are quotes from Hannah Arendt's um, totalitarianism, uh, elements and um, origins of uh, totalitarianism. This claim becomes more understandable when we bear in mind that for her, thrown out does not only mean a spatial outside of, for example, the being far from, as it is char characteristic of the flight, when a person is outside um, the territory of her homeland. Aaron's critique is rather directed at the fundamental outside of, as it is the reality for many migrants with regard to social and political participation, most sharply in the context of internment, deportation, or deprivation of citizenship, but also in marginalized economic positions. And I will come to that later. Marginalized economic positions in societies of their refuge. Um, and theorists like Jacques Rancière or Giorgio Agamben, for example, follow Arendt here, and I mean that is that is contested too, if it is that, that bad, um, if it is still that bad, but I think all of you can imagine situations um, that are real now and here. Um, for example, refugees, stateless persons, and here we see the human being is merely human being, she is the embodiment of the abstract individual par excellence, a human being divested of her politically, socially, and economically defined identity. In spite of the existence of the human rights regime, the individual is virtually in the state of nature, in the view of Arendt. And that this state of nature is not a metaphorical description, but the site of struggle for physical survival is illustrated in a particularly extreme way by the practice of intercepting old people at sea or restricting those traveling on land and their mobility with barbed wire fences, as well as that of detaining or deporting those who have reached the mainland of destination. The state of nature of human rights, as it is called, can thus be decidedly precarious, indeed a life-threatening state. And yeah, as I have already said, Arendt refers to the powerlessness and ineffectiveness of these natural moral rights with her famous, famous formula of the aporia of human rights. Franz Fanon, for example, did so too. He explains the powerlessness of human rights by reference to the liberal paradigm of the separation of the moral and the political sphere, according to which the world is divided into a zone of being and a zone of non-being. 
while in the zone of being, rights as guarantors provide for legality and protection. In the zone of non-being, they define a victim status under which fall those um, affected by margin marginalization, exploitation, and violence without being granted the same subject position as the beneficiaries of the zone of being. And there are several other examples. For example, Patrick Hayden uses uh, the term, um, even the term global apartheid for this. For Arendt, therefore, the fleeing and the stateless person is the emblematic figure par excellence. And there's much research uh, about this figure. And there are uh, accounts that um, say that the refugee is the political figure at the moment. Or it is the figure um, who shows all the um, problems and um, ambivalences of modern politics. At this point, I want to um, come to the aspiring dimension of human rights and their potential for empowerment. And this is a picture that I really like because Europe is not the center, uh, as you can see. It's a historical um, um, atlas um, from 1700, exactly. And it shows the um, um, ways over the globe, over the Atlantic. Uh, no, over the Pacif uh, Pacific, and yeah, uh, Europe is right in the only in the corner, not in the uh, center of uh, the picture. And that is that is really rare. Uh, normally, in the European context, you see pictures where Europe is the center, <clears throat> and that is just to to reflect our perception of. Things. It's, a, it's not a statement, or I, I don't want to um, uh, to apologize for that time. I mean, that is a colonialist practice already, and um, yeah, I know it is problematic, but I just want want to show you another picture of the world. At this point, the aporia of human rights shall be contrasted with the dimension of the aspiring surplus of human rights. In the aspiring aspect of human rights, one can locate the possibility of self-empowering practice of individuals. Instead of a predetermined attribution of the abstract subject status of the individual, as is typical for the contemporary human rights discourse, I, following Jacques Concierge here, want to point to the potential of human rights semantics for political subjectivation, that is, for a process in which subjects actively constitute themselves in the first place. That is a quote. Political subjectivation, according to Rancière, redefines a field of experience that gave to each their identity with their lot. It decomposes and recomposes the relationships between the ways of doing, of being, and of saying that define the perceptible organization of the community, the relationships between the places where one does one thing and those where one does something else, the capacities associated with the particular doing and those required for another. That is a bit abstract, maybe. Very French, you cannot um, uh, get it here in the English translation, um, then it is more, more easy to understand than in the French original. Rancière means that political subjects are not to be viewed as already existing entities. Instead, they constitute themselves, or they could constitute themselves, uh, for example, in the cause of the demand for certain rights as political subjects. In the process of the formation of subjects, however, the actors, as Monsieur emphatically points out, generate a political space, the result of which is initially open, and that is sometimes very hard to, um, to bear. The activities of subjectivation can lead to the creation of a new political order. In Rancière's specific terminology, 
it's a new police order, but yeah, we don't we don't have to mind here at the moment. However, they can also for the time being focus on resistance and the questioning of the existing order. And for him, the breaking of the existing order is the political moment. Now, human rights are able to play a significant role in processes of subjectivation in so far as, on the one hand, they constitute a reference point for individual political and social struggles for equality and the attainment of rights, and on the other, they are closely linked to diverse notions of an originary democratic order beyond existing political orders. Nevertheless, it should be kept in mind that the uh, affirmative reference to human rights as a guiding principle for strategies of empowerment must not be identified with a consent to the already existing version of the human rights concept as the universal declaration of human rights. On the contrary, approaches having recourse to human rights are well aware of the fact that human rights as rights in realpolitik constitute a facet of the practices of governmentality aimed at the stabilization of domination and the extension of control. If, however, in the consideration of processes of subjectivation, the emphasis is placed more strongly on the aspect of critique and the questioning of existing understandings of human rights and on the aspect of resistance to prevailing patterns of order, then there is the chance of examining the prerequisites for the formation of a normative counter order. Through a perpetual verbal questioning of the existing order, the repeated transgression of conceptual and territorial, territorial boundaries, as well as the gathering and pooling of experiences of resistance, actors can constitute themselves as a collective political subject. And historical examples, if it maybe uh, um, is too uh, abstract here, historical examples are the suffragettes and they fought against the um, um, existing gender order at that time in the 19th and early 20th century, the proletarians. And we have recent examples. Uh, for example, the movement of the saint papier in many European countries. And most recently here in Germany, for example, the movement, movement of groups of handicapped people who um, fight against the uh, the established order um, that um, differentiates between worthy and unworthy lives. And here, people who are not given the right to um, claim for themselves do it. Concerning both the naming and identification of experiences of injustice, as well as the aspirative ideas of a humane world, the vocabulary of human rights is helpful. After all, they name exactly what which should be, uh, they name exactly that which should be equally and inalienably given to humans as humans. It is then up to the concrete political disputes to determine discursively the precise content of human rights. Uh, human rights claims. In the discourse, particular importance is attached to the right to political participation, with the help of which, according to Rancière, the interval between having human rights and not having human rights could be overcome. And in this context, human rights are the synonym then for the unquenchable and self-legitimizing desire for universal rights. Universal rights is not uh, about the indifferent moral universalism of the European Enlightenment. Instead, a pluralistic resistance, resistant universalism must be developed. And here, for example, the already mentioned Ukrana uh, Bakshi, I didn't know before um, how to pronounce his name, but now I know. Um, it, um, this is his um, um, words, um, human rights can be seen as um, the reference points for insurrectionary praxis, in, in the plural, of course. And they can, made, they can uh, be made fruitful then. And other theorists like, for example, Gayatri Shakarvati Spivak, um, 
um, they think that with the uncovering of problematic implications and the co concomitant destruction, uh, deconstruction of the distorting commutations of the abstract individual as the holder of human rights, it could be made possible for the subaltern to see themselves as subjects of their own history and to empower themselves to political agency. Thus, instead of completely rejecting human rights on the basis of their Eurocentric origin and the frequent functionalization for the purposes of power, purposes of power, the option is opened up to modify the concept of human rights inventively, creatively. Then the goal of struggles about rights would not be the finished interpretation of human rights, rather, in keeping with Arendt's demand for a fundamental right to rights, it would be the primordial political right to take the right. In German, das Urrecht, sich das Recht zu nehmen. And with, uh, with a view to the clock, um, I will shorten my talk a bit. Um, for a possible modification of the understanding of human rights, which more strongly accommodates the political dimension, indeed the political condi conditionality of pluralistically constituted human life, what is thus needed above all is a critical reflection of the European origin of the legal subject. To this end, it is imperative to make the problematic inscriptions of the human rights concept of the subject clear. And first, an alternative notion of human rights would therefore firstly have to attach particular importance to the right to political participation, as I already mentioned. And secondly, drawing on socio-economically informed understandings of interpersonal communication structures and of the associated institutions, a critical theory of human rights should reflect more dialectically on the relationship between individuals and possible forms of the political community. At the moment, that is my impression, Neither the liberal nor the republican account provides a convincing concept. In the liberal picture, the, methodolo the methodolo methodological <laughs> sorry, I'm a bit distracted, no problem. Um, individualism tends to underestimate the importance of social context and belonging, and the republican accounts regard collectives such as political communities as something that precedes the individuals and run the risk to prioritize nationalist tendencies of closure. And that is a big problem at the moment, I think, because there's a shift already um, back to national... I mean, I, I speak here for the political theory, but there, are, but there is a shift to more nationalist and protectionist um, conceptions of the state and, and, and uh, um, yeah, and critiques of the European Union and, and so on. Jacques Lantier refers to this potential for political subjectivation as a democratic process, which implies the action of subjects who, by working the interval between identities, reconfigure the distribution of the public and the private, the universal and the particular. Democracy can never be identified with a simple domination of the universal of the particular. And I will, you, I will give you some examples from the praxis um, for that quote. Democracy, uh, in the third uh, section, democracy is here not identified as a mode of sovereignty or government, but as a specific practice of participation in the course of which log logics and meaning patterns of existing patterns of authority and government are disrupted and redefined if individuals, and that is the condition, are willing to see themselves as actors and to open up the political space. Democracy is then not to be confused with the general mode of sovereignty which lays down universal norms irrespective of the articulation of dissent. The modification of the understanding of human rights could then consist in revitalizing the emancipatory potential of human rights. In this way, a reduction to purely humanitarian acts and the depoliticization of human rights activities could be countered. In the return to the empowering potential originally inherent in human rights, 
uh, and I want to put it cautiously, truly universal value could be discovered, which is shared by plural concepts of subjectivation. This form of universalism, however, would not be an instrument of globalization from above. Rather, human rights, especially in subaltern context, as demanded by post-colonial criticism, can be read as an appropriation of the political subject status without necessarily having to share the content the concept of atomized utility maximizing individual inherent in the Eurocentric variant of human rights. In this open and opening reading, the originally progressively connoted event of the human rights declarations in the late 18th century, which is emphatically evoked by so many, could actually take a form in which the Aryan right to rights is understood to mean that the right to political subjectivation is owed to every individual. Now I come to the third part um, and to some examples from the, yeah, not a poetic praxis, but from the um, <coughs> praxis from art and um, political arts. Um, as Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari state, human rights as such say nothing about the imminent modes of existing of people provided with rights, and I think that is very true. Yet, uh, I'm sorry. Yet um, human rights understood as insurrectionary practices, as Bakshi does it, do not request very much in the first place to understand modes of existence. The most important thing is to listen to the marginalized who are convinced that they do have the primordial political right, the Urrecht, to take the right, even if they do not have already the legal right to do so. A second step could be to identify the already existing struggles for political demands, and that is for the claim for economic autonomy as well as for political autonomy as an important aspect of personal and collective autonomy, especially in the context of poverty, and even more in the context of gender poverty, as I um, um, had to get to know now in my research. Concerning the aspect of economic autonomy, it can be stated that the empowering political potential of human rights is not fully exploited in many UN human rights documents. And I will do a survey on that even if I'm not an empiric um, um, researcher, but a political philosopher, but um, here I have to go into the details of the, um, of the documents on the one hand and um, in um, the um, texts and um, actions by NGOs, for example, and other actors in the global human rights context. In most declarations, um, the poor, and especially poor women, are indeed conceptualized as actors, but these roles are often defined by asymmetric attributions and often remain, therefore, more in the, more, in the mere humanitarian, non-public realm than in the political. And as part of a critical human rights semantics, human rights could hence at least serve as a radical interrogation reservoir and thus assume a role that seems to have somewhat fallen into oblivion in the course of a sometimes over-affirmative human rights policy. Wendy Brown, for example, points out that the current human rights regime and its rhetoric must be reminded that the realization of human rights does not consist, does not consist in the enlargement of market-compliant freedom of choice objects, and you have already mentioned in your introduction, but that they are threatened precisely by this regime's often undemocratic and hegemonic enforced interventionist remedies against so-called human suffering. Brown certainly does not deny that human suffering is to be combated, yet she doubts whether prevention and alleviation of suffering are ultimately, quote, the most that can be hoped for, just because the hopes for more than the alleviation of suffering for inclusive participation and democratic equality must be considered as utopian. At this point, however, Wendy Brown's pessimism 
reveals precisely its opposite, namely that the present conception of human rights is definitely not the best that can be hoped for. It is therefore all the more important that people around the world make their diverse views of human life as well as their desire to have a political say in the conditions of life heard. And here can come my examples. Um, but before that, I have another quote, and um, because this light is coming, I have to read it up for you. This would already be the first step towards self-empowerment. And Claude Lefort's um, notion of a pol politics of human rights proceeds from this empowering potential. Human rights politics and democratic politics are two different ways of responding to the same demand, to exploit the resources of liberty and faith creativity from which an experience derives its power to bear the effects of the division, to resist the temptation to exchange the present for the future, but rather to make the effort to trace in the present the prospects of success which become apparent through the defense of acquired rights and the demand for new rights, and by doing so to learn to differentiate these from the mere satisfaction of interest. Certainly, this form of human rights activism and a prospective human rights politics Avenir is, if at all, just at the beginning of its possibilities of development. What the future of human rights theory and politics would, will look like in the global political negotiation process about them will soon be initiated, I am doubtful, but um, and they are in, the, in, the, um, uh, in, in theory there are many um, examples uh, for democracy without the demos and transnational citizenship and so on and so on. But I promised you to give you some examples from the practice, praxis. And for example, this is a, I um, would say, the normal um, task for NGOs always to protest and to bring forward, um, um, yeah, New ideas, here for example, um, it is not economic autonomy, the term, but food sovereignty, which is related um, to um, the fight against uh, poverty. These are some examples they want to uh, influence or to initiate uh, new UN declarations. But then, and, and it is important, I do not want to um, neglect these um, efforts, but um, maybe that is not, not exactly that what um, my theorists um, have in mind. And maybe that is more um, of this disruption. That is a, at the moment ongoing um, art project that is uh, Revolta della Dignità. Um, that takes uh, place now in, in these couple of days, um, and it is uh, led by the um, Cameroonian uh, political <coughs> activist Yvon Sanier and the French, uh, um, sorry, the um, Swiss um, artist uh, Milo Rao. And um, yeah, we can talk about it if it is a, a good um, art project, but um, it is very interesting because. Um, the political art activist Yvon Sanier um, has already started a revolution in, in the fields of um, southern Italy um, eight or nine years ago because um, he, he couldn't stand the uh, conditions under um, which the workers have to do their work in the plants. And they were exploited and um, <coughs> they, they had no rights at all. And um, then he um, started to revolt against um, these, I think the Mafia was included, was involved, and they were very successful. There is a law now, but unfortunately the law is not executed, and um, um, so they still suffer from inequality and um, exploitation. And at the moment they combine this um, political campaign with the, um, with the film, and maybe you have already uh, recognized it is um, a new um, film about um, Jesus and the new gospel, 
and it takes place in Matera, the um, um, European capital of culture at the moment, and um, does um, yeah does deal with the resurrection of Jesus. And I don't want to say that this is the solution for human rights problems, but um, uh, not at all. But um, there you can see. That was um, their protest. They smashed the tom tomatoes um, to show um, the um, uh, yeah the exploitation and their suffering. And they are a big movement at the moment, and they disrupt the economic order in Italy. Thank you very much. For the